Hey everyone, welcome back to Beyond. Be sure to hit like and subscribe so others can find the channel. Today we really have a really uh, important subject that's certainly in the media if you're really paying attention, and that's human trafficking. Um, human trafficking is absolutely a global pandemic. We, we think about COVID-19 as a pandemic. You want to talk about the impact on lives. Um, we're talking hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people that are entrapped in human trafficking worldwide. So let's talk about human trafficking or also known as modern slavery. It is illegal trade in human beings throughout recruitment or abduction by means of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of forced labor, debt bondage, or sexual exploitation. And just some statistics, about 25 million people are victims of forced labor. Women and girls are disproportionately affected by human trafficking, accounting for 71% of all victims, and 3.8 million adults are trafficked for sexual exploitation, and 1, point, or, or 1 million children are trafficked for commercial sexual exploitation. And we know, um, if you just look at the recent headlines, here's some headlines in the news. 26 people found in human smuggling operation at Houston home. New York Attorney General bus jet exec in child se sex trafficking probe. Four yeah. cents and deaths of 39 Vietnamese migrants in the UK. 33 missing children rescued during human trafficking probe in California. Today, I'm really pleased to bring back to the Beyond Show, Kelly Galindo, who is the director, creative, executive producer of 26 Seconds, a documentary fo focused on the horror of sex trafficking around the world. Kelly, welcome. Hi, Ben. So good to see you again. Thank you for having me. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm fired up to have you back. And I'll tell you, in the first show that we did, it consistently every month gets views. And I've had people come back and say, say hey, this has to get out there. This message has to get out to uh, the general populace. So when we think about 26 seconds, it takes the audience through Thailand, Cambodia, Iraq, India, East Africa, Mexico, and the U.S., what did you learn about sex trafficking as you peered behind this shadowy curtain in each of these countries? Well, the similarities, <clears throat> it's all about money, you know, for the trafficker, for the madams, for the pimps, for, and now we're starting to see that it's really very high up. And I knew that when I was in Thailand and Cambodia, because the police kind of um, turn a blind eye because they get paid off or they actually are customers as well. You know, so I already knew that it was at a lower level. I just had no idea that it was at such a high level, um, <clears throat> which is really, really um, disturbing <laughs> to say the least. And really no president ever fought against the evil of sex trafficking and putting an end to it uh, than the Trump administration. Right. Yeah. None. Okay. That, that's 100% true. And you know, what you said, it goes to the highest levels is very, very true. And some people can say that's conspiracy theory, but I'd say prove us wrong. And we- No, you know, it's not, com I mean, President Trump signed a bill to be much harsher on the traffickers online, um, which by the way, um, oh, what's his name? It's Demi Moore's ex-husband, Ashton Kutcher. He has a great organization called Thorn that does just that too, that really focuses on the online because you know, like my statistic of, of the title of my documentary, 26 Seconds, it's a statistic. Every 26 seconds, a child's traffic globally. Well, that doesn't include the online. No one knows what those numbers are online. It right. could be every one second. Right. You really don't know. I mean, it's actually very horrific what's happening. Um, so, and then, pres and then the Trump administration also signed a bill to give um, uh, funding to these organizations uh, so that it can continue helping um, the survivors from the sex trade. And th that's what my project's about. I went all around the world with different nonprofit Christian organizations that are actually doing the work. And even some of the government um, agencies, you know, like the task force or, you know, some of the HT experts that I've interviewed, like Congressman Ed Royce and judges and DAs, they've all said without the collaboration with the, the nonprofits, they would, I mean, they need their help. And, and these nonprofits are doing incredible work in rescue, restoration, um, uh, reintegration, and, and even, you know, the, the, the like task force prosecution. Right. So as you, as you went in this odyssey with 26 seconds, um, for every victim of human trafficking, they certainly have a story to share. What is one story in particular that you can, that you can look back on that really shocked your conscience? You know, the interviews, I mean, they're all horrific, but the, the interviews that were the most um, were, were when I was filming in Iraq. Like I, I always keep my composure because I, I want to the survivor to feel 
um, comfortable and not judged and that, you know, I, I, I'm with her as a woman. And these were the one, uh, uh, I cried in these interviews. They were absolutely horrific. There was a woman, she probably was only 35 or 38 and, and she looked older than me. And at that time I was probably 53 when I was in Iraq, 54, I can't remember. <laughs> but she looked older than me from, from what she had been through with ISIS. But she had um, like eight children. Every single one was abducted. Her mm -hmm. husband was killed when they went into these villages and just, you know, basically genocide. They killed the men. They took her boys, made them ISIS fighters. They took her young girls and made them sex slaves. And they took her and made her a labor slave. Well, she had one son that was um, handicapped. He was in a wheelchair. And, and it, I mean, it just broke my heart. First of all, the entire interview, she was like this. Like, she's not okay. She needs healing and therapy and uh, restoration and none of her children are back she was rescued her children were not but she she shared a story it was almost like sophie's choice you know she begged isis please take any of my children but not this one because he can't you know he he couldn't he he couldn't do anything without her right couldn't eat could nothing and they took him well you know they disposed of him yeah. he was yeah. abused you know that yeah horrific so now those were extreme. I mean, ISIS sex trafficking because they trafficked these girls amongst each other. You know, they would sell them amongst each other. It wasn't like on the streets. It's not brothels. It's not massage parlors. It's not online. Well, they did do it online. They would sell online actually, but they sold them amongst each other. And also in Iraq, there was a little seven-year-old. At the time I interviewed her, she was 10, but she was seven when she was abducted. They had sex with this child. She had five different traffickers or ISIS fighters that owned her. I mean, and and this is this story is not um, uncommon. Uh, uncommon. Yeah. 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 So so based on your research, what you found is the most debilitating effects of sex trafficking? I mean, you just talked about a harrowing story, but as you talk to a person that's been through it. What would you say is the most debilitating uh, impact of that experience? It well, first of all, one thing that I from interviewing these girls, every single one was molested as a child, usually, except ISIS. That was an extreme situation. They were, a, you know, that was genocide and that was different. But all of the other survivors were molested as children, ninety-nine point nine percent. So they're already set up at a young age to devalue and not trust. And uh, I mean, and shame and all of those feelings that come, confusion, all of those feelings that come as they should as it's a young child. They don't, they're trying to figure this out, but they're already targeted, right? They're already prone to. Um, so that's the first thing. But of course, when you're trafficked and, and you're having sex with five to 10 men a night and somebody else is making money off of you and you are basically a sex slave because they take your cell phone away, they take your, you know, they won't feed you, they won't, you know, they'll beat you if, you know, if you're, get out of line. So when they're rescued and, and I, I mean, I personally don't know how anyone with any kind of trauma or abuse can be rescued without Jesus in the middle of it, without uh, Christianity, without, because all of these um, nonprofit Christian organizations bring God into their healing. Mm -hmm. And that is, and I, I, cause I don't know how these little girls can recover without God. Yeah. That was my next question. Can these survivors find peace, meaning purpose beyond their horrific experiences? I would imagine if you didn't have a spiritual or heavenly component to it, what, what is the point? What is the point of going through what I just went through? What is the point of, of horrors that that most people's planet don't necessarily go through, but I did go through? I mean, so how do you find that meeting outside of, outside of God? I don't know if you can, to be honest. Um, but I do know that back to your original question, what are these girls, what are they up against? A lifetime of um, post- um, it's like a, what, uh, what, what is it called when uh, men in the army? Yeah, PTSD. they have that. It's complete trauma. And some 
In fact, you know that I've, you know, because it's been uh, taking a while to raise funding to complete the feature to include all the nine countries I filmed. But I decided over quarantine because I was like, okay, now what? <laughs> We're sitting at home. So I started editing um, videos for the 26 Seconds YouTube channel from the US content only. Um, because all of that would not fit in the feature. Each each country will only get like 15 minutes in the feature. So I thought, okay, I have all these great organizations. L let's let's create awareness about the issue. Let's create awareness about 26 seconds. But let's highlight these nonprofits that are doing incredible work because they won't fit in my feature, and they're doing incredible work. So I was really careful to only because I, I in each country I interviewed about eight survivors, but here in the U.S. I interviewed about 26 mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but I was really careful in these videos to only uh, share right now um, the the survivors that have turned into survivor advocates. So they're they they're kind of on the other side. They've gone through extensive amount of um, restoration and healing, and now they're out there as survivor advocates to speak up against this um, uh, horrific uh, reality and, and and share their truth. So I you know I think that that is helpful. Um, sorry, my kitty's calling to birds. Can you hear her? Yeah. <laughs> now, this is Zoom. <laughs> this is <Yep>. Zooming. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I, I, I was really careful right now. I mean, of course, when I get to the feature, you know, I'm going to tell the story the way I feel that it should be told. Obviously, I can't uh, share eight survivors from each country. It'll probably only be one or two from each country, it, you know, maybe one. So uh, I think, but I, you know, the girls, the survivors that wanted to be interviewed, um, it's because they wanted to share their story. I remember one of the girls from Iraq was like, please get this out there. Because at that time, um, you know, I, uh, they were still, they weren't liberated yet. I mean, ISIS was, it was still happening when I was right. there filming. <laughs> Well, you know, what's, what's really interesting, and I think it's really important for the audience to understand, again, we talked about this, about 1.2 million children are tra trafficked every year, and every 26 seconds, one is brought into sex trafficking. This is a child, right? And we know what drives a trade around the world is money. It's, it's, it's more, more money than drugs or, or weapons worldwide, because you can resell uh, these children again and again. It's about $150 billion industry annually and probably growing as we speak. Um, so what are the economic benefits? I mean, obviously there's money to be made, but is, is that really what drives the practice and the trade? And certainly pornography feeds into it. Is it really an economic driven uh, business model? Well, it's, it wouldn't exist if there wasn't a demand for it. So the problem is with uh, people that are buying other people and children for their sexual pleasure. So if there was no demand, there would traffickers would then go back to selling drugs and weapons but there's there's a demand in in having sex with children and young women right right and you know i was raised for one of your uh, i went to your uh, website 26 seconds or actually your your youtube channel and i was listening to one of the uh the i think it was the uh officers down in san diego talking about the sort of dark underbelly of san diego certainly newport beach and the amount of human trafficking that goes under the noses or the awareness of most people in those areas. I mean, it's just epidemic down there, the number of people that are trafficked in those, in those communities. Well, you know, I, uh, part of the reason I filmed in LA and Orange County and San Diego was mostly because, you know, it was convenient to where I live because I live, you know, in Orange County, right? And at first I was like, how is this going to represent the U.S.? And, you know, as always, God knows exactly what he's doing. Um, because I also filmed at the Super Bowl in Minneapolis. And I also filmed in Las Vegas, which is expected in Vegas. But what people aren't expecting when you live in the Midwest or back East or in another country is like, what? Orange County, San Diego, what? <laughs> and the reason why it, I mean, and literally traffickers, because they go on a circuit. They literally will cross state lines and bring girls into Orange County specifically because and San Diego, because there's more money to be made. It's, sure. it's, it's you know, affluent. It's, um, uh, you know, there's the, people have money and, and, and the conventions, you know, so men come in to work at conventions and it's kind of like the mentality, you know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. I mean, these are like, and they're like family men. They think they're good guys, but they're away. Yeah. yeah. They know that girl is young. 
They know she's so, young. So are these are these are, not, are these children that are trafficked? Are these young people? Are they coming from outside the United States? Or are they being taken from within the United States and moved around the United States? Within the United States and around the United States. It also happens the other way, but it's but it's alive and well here, right here in the United States. People yeah. profiting. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, so but, just what, a, but coming back to, I just want to bring, because, you know, San Diego also, there's a border issue. Right. You know, children are trafficked, are taken and abducted too. I have an interview of one girl that, well, actually her story, she was from Mexico. Her mother and her moved um, to, the, to the United States in San Diego. And she, she married a, 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 an American man. And he... Um, molested her and then started trafficking her and then he took her back to Tijuana mm -hmm. and put her in the brothels and trafficked her there I mean this is crazy so but there are traffickers that will take children they go to schools and and befriend them and groom them and they cross the border over into Tijuana and then also obviously children from Tijuana are brought here right terrific so, you know, as we think about just for the audience, you know, hum human trafficking, by the way, is the fastest growing criminal enterprise in the world, right? Human trafficking has contributed in part to mass migration, refugee displacement. President Trump certainly, as you alluded to, had the policies along the border right, build the wall, and through policy ensure the legal, lawful immigration um, of, of human beings going from point A to point B, right? And I wanted to play something because I think it's emblematic of the Biden administration. This was uh, just reported today. And I don't know if most people have seen this. Um, bear with me as I try to share my screen. Um, but this is uh, President Biden going up the stairs of Air Force One today. Not one, not two, but three times as he's trying to go up the stairs. And as I looked at that image of him going up the stairs and eventually coming back to salute, uh, well, eventually goes up the stairs to salute. You know, I, I looked at that and I said, you know, that's really metaphorical of his policies along the borders. I mean, people don't really appreciate it. It's, it's one thing to say, hey, um, we're the bastion that everybody wants to come to because it's America and that's what we do. That's our character. Um, but what I'd poise the audience is, have you ever heard of lifeboat ethics? Visualize the United States as a lifeboat, a life raft. And you have the sea of humanity trying to get into that boat. Eventually the boat will sink. And if you look at um, what I call under Biden, you know, he self-manufactured a crisis at the border to ensure, in my opinion, election wins in the future under the guise of more humane immigration policy. But in fact, as I was reading some of these statistics, um, the borders are being flooded by unaccompanied minors, by young children in particular, at a rate of 2,200 per week. So right now, estimates um, place the number of kids being what I'd call incarcerated or locked up at over 15,000 today along the border. And these same kids aren't getting showers, aren't necessarily getting food. And these are from Democrats, Congress people talking about this. Um, well, also, they, they under the guise of, oh, the children, the children, the children, they don't care about the children. Those children are trafficked on the way to America and at that detention center. I mean, and then once they're released, I mean, this is crazy what's happening. It is. And, and the cartels are bringing these kids in. So yeah. what happens when they get released? I also read that they give people just papers that you can actually Xerox to allow them to get on a plane to go anywhere they want to go in the United States. Well, and, and of course, the, uh, the, uh, the person that runs FEMA, he said, well, you know, we'll make sure they go to adults that can take care of them. Well, what does that mean? They can't even track the people coming in. They certainly can't track the people that are leaving those detention facilities with whoever they're going with. And to me, Kelly, that's just a perfect setup for human trafficking and really exponentially expo exploding the problem within the United States. Oh, without a doubt, President Trump putting, um, you know, stricter at the border, having stricter um, uh, laws at the border brought down human trafficking, without a doubt. And so now it's on the rise again, of course. You know, there's a story of, you know, the organization, I don't know if you saw the video, but of airline ambassadors, they're a great organization. She was a flight attendant um, and she created airline ambassadors because she thought, okay, we're, we need to do something. We see sometimes children accompanied with people that like possibly aren't their parents or the child seems uncomfortable. So she created airline ambassadors for a flight attendants and then it ex started expanding into everyone in the, the airline industry. Um, but to be aware of, of if they thought a child, you know, something was not right. And so what's so awesome about being in the air is all they don't have to do anything other than 
make a phone call. And when the plane lands, uh, the police check it out and it's federal at that point. So they're actually preventing like traffickers bringing children into the states or crossing state lines, right? But she shared a story about a, um, a, uh, a trafficker who brought someone from Mexico and he to the border, right? Then he went back and uh, adopted this child because he was now an American, he had citizenship and then was trafficking these kids. So he'd bring them over, get them in the detention center and then go back and like be their, their guardian and traffic them. I mean, this is, this is crazy. And you know, these kids aren't going to go to the best and the brightest and the most moral, right? So if people can make money, they'll figure out a way to make money. And you can take the most morally minded person and put them in a compromised situation. And, and one could argue uh, they, may, they may go to the path of least resistance. And so when we think about you know, uh, what, what feeds, we talked about pornography, right? And we talk about pedophilia, exploitation of kids, child sex abuse, and messaging that supports the depra this depravity, I would argue is rampant in Hollywood and certainly in our society. There's so much imagery related to this sort of topic. And in fact, if you just look at the, the most recent um, Grammy Awards, I, I would say it's glamorized. We see Cardi B defining sexual deviancy downward in her, in my opinion, pathetic performance of the Grammy Awards. Um, that, by the way, set an all times rating low, which says to me that when you go woke, you go broke. When you take values that most people hold dear and you try to twist and pervert, people just turn it off, which I, which I love. I love it when the market wakes up and, and sends the right message. But I do believe Americans are waking up, Kelly, to the reality of what the elites are pushing. And this is an important topic. You're trying to fund 26 seconds. And I would argue that this would just hit the wall in Hollywood because they're not interested in what you're trying to push in this, in this oh video. no i oh. i learned about two years ago i went when, when when netflix released cuties it was about the exploitation of little children little 10 year olds being strippers i went oh they're not interested in my project no and they're on the opposite side they're no. not interested no. in my project so i knew so and i clearly heard god tell me and this was right before the pandemic happened and he said just start editing just start putting this content out and, you know, from day one, you know, I, I stepped out in faith. God has opened every door. And this really is me being on God's train, right? This is really me um, doing what God wants me to do for these children. It's not about making money. It's not about, you know, you know, it would have been nice. Of course, any filmmaker wants to have accolades, but it's no longer about that. We're past that. Society has, I mean, it's in such, it's in crisis mode. Like people need to wake up. And so I, okay, so I have all this footage. I'm going to just edit and put it out there. If, if, right. it be, right. if someone invests and it becomes a feature, great. If it doesn't, well, I own my footage. I'm putting it out. I have to. Well, I think you, you said the operative word. It, to me, it's the great awakening. I think of like-minded people that go to school or, or work a job, raise a family, pay their bills, play by the rules, right? These are people that, they see America one way and they, they understand it a certain way. We have mass mainstream media that doesn't always share the reality of what's going on, in fact, hides it. And so people are sort of going along with that agenda or that dogma or that philosophy, if you will, un un unknowingly, I would argue, because if the reality was really shared with people, I don't think people would sit idly by with what's going on with human trafficking no. and some of the, the craziness taking place in America today. And I think your, your film just provides the opportunity to continue to wake people up, educate them, because people are super smart. Once they have data, they can figure out what needs to happen. They and need to know also where, I mean, how it started me um, filming with these nonprofits was because that was the way I would have access to filming undercover with rescue agents to be able to interview um, uh, survivors, you know, but but it's bigger than that. Now it's, it's, it's I mean, I clearly heard God say to me, I want you to include in your film what I'm about to reveal. This was recently. This was like a month ago. And I'm like, what else? <laughs> right. And I and, you know, you and I know what it else it's about. It's about pedophilia at the highest levels. Right. And I said, but 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 God, it, uh, I filmed a nonprofit organizations. He goes, exactly. They have been soldiers for, for this fight and they need to be um, recognized so that the, the people will know who where they can go to help because they're going to be very busy restoring, rescuing and restoring children. Well, clearly uh, I've heard that. 
Yeah, no, I'll come back to that because if we think about what the CIA has done and what agencies have done around the world, it's called a honeypot. And they'll get very high level people, Congress people, senators, business people at the very highest echelons of society and get them in a compromising position. Think Jeffrey Epstein Island, think um, Playboy Mansion was, was epic in that regard. They would film people and they'd have the goods on people and then they could control these people. So it happens all the time. And so my next question is, when we think about what's happening on the border, you know, thousands of kids in particular are coming up. Doesn't it strip the resources of, of you know, the local officials and, and, and the counselors and all the people that are involved in trying to deal with human traffic? I mean, I mean how I'm do we deal with this you, surge? If it wasn't for these nonprofits helping, because they really are leading the fight, because they, they're all donation-based, they're nonprofits. And they are out there rescuing, restoring, housing these girls, reintegrating them. I mean, without them, I, I, I mean, this would be a lost, lost cause. And back to, I want to um, mention two things that you talked about. One about uh, the highest elites. I have an interview of a girl. She, I mean, she's not a girl. She's now a woman. She's 50. But when she was a girl, she was actually abducted. Um, at, she was like 12, 13 years old, taken to a home in Palm Springs started giving her drugs. So she's drugged out of her mind and then gets dependent. They put her behind a glass. There were children there between two and 18. This is in Palm Springs, a huge ranch. And then, and they're drugged out and dependent children. And she would hear them say, Congressman, Senator, what, yeah. what is happening? And I have that interview. Yeah, and really, I'm not surprised at all. I mean, that doesn't even shock me anymore. And again, yeah. Party B and how you train a society to think about things and how you mm -hmm. desensitize a society to, de to, to look at certain things a certain way and where it no longer creates a rise out of anybody. It's like no big deal. And it's yeah. unbelievable because I would argue the impact on these kids that have been tortured, I'd call it torture, the mental yeah. impact for a lifetime is palpable. These people, these kids can't function at the highest levels have, having gone through this, especially if they don't get the help they need psychologically to sort of piece your way through what it all meant in context. I mean, it's well, it's, hard, well, to, it's hard to overcome. If I'm not mistaken, I think Cardi B herself was um, a call girl or a stripper or something. Like she, she was in the industry. And so now it's just on a world stage for her. She actually needs restoration and healing. You, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I mean, she's coming out of, a life of her own abuse and trauma, obviously, and has turned it into now a gold mine because society are driven by sex and money, right? right. Um, you know, rappers do the same thing. They put the, you know, the what they're saying in those rap songs are just conditioning children. I interviewed, um, I, and I actually like him very much. His name is Armin King, but he was a pimp in the 80s and 90s or what have you. Now he has an organization called um, Paved to Great Futures, and he you know, obviously he's out of that life. He's a Christian now. And he um, mentors uh, uh, boys in gangs because usually they don't have fathers. And he even said himself, uh, you know, we were just following what the rappers were saying. Like, it's cool to be a pimp, you know, that we saw him with cars and money and, you know, and he um, now has this organization where he invests in these young kids and he has a culinary school to try to give them a, um, you know, to be able to reintegrate them in another way, be able to make money in another way because they really saw no other way. So they actually are victims too. You know, um, uh, I'm telling you, the problem is the demand. There would be no pimping. There would be no trafficking. There would be no making money off children if there wasn't a demand for it. Yeah, and the feed of demand with everything we see in, in uh, you know, pop culture, right? That, that's just absolutely that's the feeder of people's insatiable desires for sure. So I, I think I shared with you last time, the last interview we had, uh, because I had, I was so upset. I think the Super Bowl just happened when we were interviewed because I filmed at the Su Super Bowl, and then you, and then when I w interviewed with you, it was another Super Bowl, but it, and it was the one with Jennifer Lopez and Shakira, and I was sickened because everyone knows there's been a lot of press that uh, sex trafficking happens at Super Bowls and Olympics and these big events, right? But the, they were really pushing and and spreading the word and creating awareness that it happens at Super Bowls, and then and then when they perform, I mean. She's talented. Why did she have to have cages? Why did Shakira have to have her hands tied? Why? Just dance. 
Just saying, I, th I think I shared that with you last Tilly week. Tilly Dean is all involved in it. all part of the problem. They're all promoting us. In fact, this last Super Bowl, we had a guy that was basically showing Satan coming down from the skies. I mean, it's, yeah. it's all part of the demonic push to desensitize people. And we really are in a war, uh, what I call a spiritual warfare. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you just look at what's going on politically in people's hearts and minds, I mean, you think about how do you get to somebody in, in Rwanda, they had they had um, a, a period of their country's history where um, neighbor fought against neighbor and a million people died in that, in that process. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until they caught the word of the Lord or, or the word of God. And you started changing their heart at a heart level. Did you change their minds? Right. Mm -hmm. And I'd say, unless you change the heart um, people, it's easy to go deeper into depravity. But then when you go deeper into depravity, boy, it's hard to figure a way out. And the way that people take out is not always the best way out. Right. Well, I want to share one thing, and you know this. If you know, if you read the Bible and know, yes, there's going to be destruction. It's revelations. But in the end, and if anyone's listening that doesn't know God, you must know that God does win. He does win. So I, I would turn from <laughs> turn from your sin quick <laughs> so that you're on the good side and and not the um, demonic side that is um, destroying children and lives because there will be um, consequences and repercussions for for those people that don't stop this. Yeah, and I think I think a big part of it, Kelly, is awareness. And you know, it, to me, it's like. It's never about sermonizing or telling people how they should live. But listen, when you make choices, you feel the pain. And when mm -hmm. your choices are great, you don't feel the pain as much, right? In fact, you feel right. the elation of those good choices. And when your choices are bad, and it, it's sort of like natural laws, right? I can say, listen, hey, Kelly, see that building over there? I'm going to jump off. And you're going to say, Ben, that's a 10-story building. Hey, I got this. Don't worry. I can fly. And you're going to say, <laughs> wait a minute, Ben. Unless you have the countervailing law of aerodynamics and you have an ability to fly, you're going to fly right in the ground at a high rate of speed and you're going to kill yourself. That's a choice I made, right? And I think it's not about, to me, ever lecturing people on, you, you should, you know, you should do this. It's about, hey, you know what? If you try to avoid and, and go around natural law and you get yeah. into drugs, you get into pornography, you go deep in that area and you want to rationalize and justify it, knock yourself out because there will be an unintended consequences. And we can see it, the landscape just littered with people and lives that have just been destroyed, trying to work their way back to some sort of semblance of reality and normalcy. And yeah, I actually got my master's in spiritual psychology and, and what they taught was exactly what you're saying is, you know, there's, there's a spirit, they even said this spiritual law of gravity, just like gravity, you jump off, well, <laughs> bad news, there's a consequence, right? And there's there, but there's also spiritual gravity. So you do good, good comes back. If you do bad, bad comes back, period. It's very simple. It's what you put out, you get back in life. Exactly. It's really simple. Well said, well said. So um, it, as we think about the, the, the experts trying to deal with this, and this is what I really worry about. I know there's a lot of nonprofits, but still it comes down to the police, um, you know, the people investigating this on the, on the, on the law enforcement side and the courts. Um, what do you think that we, what do we need to do as a society to equip these experts to deal with and manage what I'd call is this humanitarian crisis of, of human trafficking? Well, you know, the, the Orange, Orange County um, Human Trafficking Task Force, and there's a task force throughout the United States, and, and it's even international, you know, they kind of have like a federal um, um, guideline that they follow. Um, but the, the Orange County is very successful, their task force, and the reason being is because they partner with these nonprofits that are doing great work. So I, I'm hoping that all of these task force um, partner with the nonprofits, because they do, once they, they arrest the trafficker or they uh, rescue the girl, they need to put them into uh, safe homes and they need to put them into a home where they can be restored. And by the way, that's a big issue too. There's not enough homes for, for, for survivors. Mm -hmm. And they do need like years of um, healing. And, and, it, and it's with trained therapists, trauma therapists. Yeah. So, yeah. I read also that, you know, a lot of these, these children that are human trafficked are in such denial or such emotional uh, disrepair that they don't want to leave their johns, right? Because the world they know is better than the world they don't know. The world of freedom, potentially, they'd rather stay trapped because they at least get that meal a day. They at least get shelter. Well, 
Good. Just to, you're absolutely right, but it's not John's. It's their pimp or their trafficker. Sorry, they don't want to leave yeah. their, yeah, yeah, yeah. John's the, the purchaser. Um, yeah, no, you're right. They all fall in love with them and they'll, they'll take the rap that they will not. I mean, a lot of it is fear. I, they are manipulated for sure. And they are, if, if they're trafficked by this pimp at 12 years old, they're 12 years old. Of course they think that's their boyfriend or they love him. They don't know anything else. Right. So they are in love. They think they are. They they are definitely manipulated, and they are definitely in fear of their life. But they will not rat out. I, I, I've interviewed three DAs, and they've all said the same thing. They, an, a survivor will not rat out their pimp. They'll t they'll go to jail for them. Isn't that something? Uh, I think it's something interesting. They're twelve years old with this pimp, and that means their emotional development is radically stunted by the time they're right. seventeen, eighteen, and that's where the therapy really needs to kick in. I mean, how do you catch up with that? Five years of critical growth phase in a life between 12 and what I'd argue 17, 18, and it's been totally destroyed. I'm telling you, it can't happen without God in the center of it. Yeah. Cannot. So what is your call to action to the audience of beyond? Call to action would be first, first educate yourself, you know, read, read, read. There's, there's, there's films out there. I, I very much encourage you to follow 26 seconds YouTube channel because I'm releasing videos um, from the US content. So you can become aware of all these nonprofits that are doing great work. Um, and you may want to, um, you know, volunteer somewhere or join the cause in some way, whatever your gifts are, you know, we all have different gifts, you know, so, some aren't to be out on the street rescuing, but it could be a prayer group. It could be raising funding for these organizations. It could, you know, whatever it is. Like you, you're 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 spreading awareness by your your podcast. I'm doing what I do, uh, you know, a documentary, and I'm a filmmaker. So whatever your gifts are, you you know, it's it's you know. I remember this friend told me, and it's so true. You know, God loves us no matter if we're to the right or to the left. I personally chose to get on God's train. Now, if I chose to get off the train, he'll still love me, but the train keeps going. God has a, a has a mission to complete. And if we're on that train, you experience unbelievable blessings and miracles, and you get to be a, in partnership with God. So I encourage your audience, you know, to jump on the God train. Yeah. Jump yeah. on that train. Good, good messaging. And, and where can they go to your website? Is it 26seconds.com? Uh, yeah, it's 26 seconds doc.com uh so 26 seconds uh you know two six and then seconds uh with an s plural and then doc doc for uh documentary.com so that's the website and then and then you can just look up on youtube i'm also on rumble by the way but it's 26 seconds um documentary youtube channel and rumble um what else uh you everything is on the website like if they want to uh, donate to uh help us finish our film they just push the donate here button mm -hmm. um that money not only helps us to complete the, the documentary but also my agreements with the nonprofits are if there's money made you know I, I usually documentaries don't make money but if there is money made um which is the goal because and then we know it's getting to the masses because that's that's the point is creating awareness but if money is made half of that percentage that if I do make money on this documentary is going to be um, divided evenly among all the organizations that are highlighted and featured in the documentary so that they, because they need, they do need money and they are doing great work. They, you know, they already have a uh, machine that's working in either rescue restoration or reintegration. And it's better just to help give money to them so they can continue the great work that they're doing. I personally went, you know, to these countries with these people. And I can tell you, um, undoubtedly that they are, they are, um, solid organizations. They're solid in, in their beliefs in God and in their, um, in, in their fight to eradicate human trafficking for sure. Well, you know, they're definitely spiritual beings because what they're taking on with human trafficking means you got to care at a different level. I mean, if it's all about yeah. you, money, having the goods, looking good, feeling good, these aren't these organizations. These are people that really care about the suffering, um, the, the, the exploitation of, of people. Um, yep. I know I've actually interviewed several of these organizations here in Orange County, and they're really salt of the earth people. So to, you know, to the audience of Beyond, I encourage you to go to Kelly's website, consider donating, uh, spread this message, um, become more aware, and, and hopefully with enough people involved, we can really start to make some inroads into this whole nightmare called human trafficking. Absolutely. Amen. Kelly, you're a gift. Thank you for all you're doing and, and your passion towards this, this important cause. 
and really enjoyed this second conversation. Oh, good. Thank you so much, Ben. <laughs> right. Take care.